high class in this particular really chapter 10, so the last two market structures of our four structure theory. So they call monopolist competition and also oligopoly. All right, so think about the laundry detergent you have in the supermarket. Um, you're going to see very few brand for them. Um, so this is not your perfect competition anymore because for perfect competition, everybody sells the same good. But for laundry detergent, they're different. And also this is not a monopoly because there's there are multiple company selling similar product. So think about Johnson Johnson, 3M. So they're all in the market selling something similar. So market is, this market is somewhat competitive, uh, but still individual companies have control over the prices. Um, all right, so let's look at our definition for imperfect competition. So we had the perfect competition, which is was the, uh, you remember we talked about the, bro the broccoli uh, market, the banana market, when you have many, many companies selling the same good, that was a perfect competition. Now for the oligopoly and the monopolist competition, they're defined as imperfectly competitive. So market is still very competitive, but we don't have this perfect condition anymore. So in monopolistic competition, we have many companies, so just like perfect competition, um, but they sell similar and uh, differentiated good. Now, if you remember from what we learned in the perfect competition, everybody sells the same good. And then in the oligopoly, you have a few companies. So monopolistic, you have many companies. Oligopoly is few companies, so two, three, four, five, six, and then everybody are all in the same industry. And then what made this what made the oligopoly special because the market is small enough that the action of one company can have impact on the other companies. And that's called the oligopoly. All right, so now what's a differentiated product? So this is whenever, um, you know, the consumer perceives the product in a very distinctive way, right? So this might be the scent, the color, um, even the the, uh, the touch, right? So um, so companies will try to take advantage of the differentiation, try to distinguish themselves and then set themselves apart than everybody else. So one example of a perfect competition, I mean, uh, monopolistic competition, uh, think about the clothing industry, right? So your company like Gap, Forever 21, H&M, uh, those companies sell something very similar, but there's minor difference in those products. And that minor difference allow the companies to um, to to distance themselves uh, uh, from the competitors and also charge a higher prices. And that's what's unique about this monopolistic competition. So you're going to have many, many companies. They all sell similar but differentiated good. And we're also going to see something called a free entry, free exit. Now, this is what we learned in the perfect competition again. So that means companies can freely join the market. They can freely enter market. Now, when you look at the demand curve, so for companies in perfect competition, we have a flat demand curve. That means each company here is a price taker. You take what the price already set. You cannot set your own prices. Now, if you see a downward sloping demand curve, then this, um, so this would be a monopoly situation. So for monopoly, now if you compare the monopoly to the monopolist competition, notice the monopolist competition, the demand curve is more flat and that indicating a situation of more uh, elastic demand. So consumer have choices, but uh, in a monopoly situation, because demand curve is more steep, there's a more inelastic demand. So consumer don't have any choices. They have to purchase what is required or uh, what, what is available in the book. So monopolistic competitions, like any of your regular companies, their goal is to try to maximize the profit. And to maximize profit, um, they're going to set where the marginal cost equal to marginal revenue. Now, one difference that you're going to see between the monopolist competition and a perfect competition is really this demand curve. So similar to our monopoly, monopolistic competition also face a downward sloping demand curve. So imagine we see a diagram here. Um, so again, the first thing I'm looking for is where the marginal cost equal to marginal revenue. So that will be right here, marginal cost equal to marginal revenue. Um, go down, find the quantity. So at this level, at quantity of 40, our profit is maximized or our cost is minimized. And then what you want to do, go up to your demand curve. 
So on the demand curve at $16, that is our price. And also on the average cost curve, that is the average cost. So this gray area, that's representing, representing this profit for this monopolistic competition. Um, now, this profit representing profit for an individual company. But remember, we have this uh, free entry, free exit we mentioned earlier that in perfect competition with free entry, free exit, other company are free to join, compete against your existing companies. In monopolistic competition, we have the same free entry, free exit. So when this one company is making a positive profit, other company will see it and then join in, compete against this one company. So when more companies join and compete, this will shift our demand curve to the left because the market become more competitive. So when demand curve shift to the left for this one individual company, um, shift to left, we're gonna see lower price level at a lower price level that eventually that profit will go away. All you're gonna do is that in the long run for companies in perfect in monopolistic competition, and just like perfect competition in the long run, because of free entry, free exit, we're gonna see zero economic profit. So in the long run, um, let's say for this diagram over here, in the long run, the demand curve will be at D1, and it will be just tangent to your average cost curve. So at point C here, your price, is equal to the average cost, and then we have a zero profit, and that's breaking even, so zero economic profit. So at point C, that is our long run equilibrium for companies in monopolistic competition. Now in the short run, everything's possible. So in the short run, company can make a profit, company can lose money or even break even, but in the long run, because of free entry, free exit, the company will always just breaking even. So everybody make zero economic profit in monopolistic competition, okay? All right, so um, another point about monopolistic competition, um, the most efficient format of market structure is your perfect competition, because at perfect competition, um, your price uh, is equal to the marginal cost, uh, that's equal to the marginal revenue, right? So that's true for perfect competition. Um, but for monopolistic competition, you're gonna see where the price uh, it's more than marginal cost. So um, monopolist competition is also not efficient, uh, just like our monopoly. So there will be some dead weight loss in the market because monopolist competitors um, will charge a price that's more than marginal cost. And uh, again, the most efficient uh, market will be our perfect competition. All right, so next let's look at oligopoly. So oligopoly, this is whenever you have a small number of firms in the same market structures, and they, the company have a choice. They can either uh, compete against each other very fiercely, uh, driving down the prices, and then we're gonna see the market becoming more like a perfect competition. The price is very low, and then everybody's just making zero profit. Um, but if the company choose to work together and behave as a monopoly, then the company can share their profit in the market. So the best outcome for companies in the oligopoly structure is to collude. Um, so collude by definition is whenever companies work together uh, to act as one, that's called collusion. This is the best outcome because when company collude, uh, they can get the most profit from the market and they can share the profit, you know, fairly however they determined. However, um, company always have an incentive to cheat under the system. So when they cheat, the market become more competitive and then eventually price goes down and you're gonna see a very competitive market structures that price goes down and then profit goes away. So another definition you need to know is cartel. Cartel is whenever you have companies have a formal agreement to behave as a monopoly. Um, so the biggest cartel in the world is a group called OPEC. Um, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. So think about countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar, UAE, they're all part of uh, OPEC. And then what that cartel does, they will meet once a month to determine what is the overall production for oil is. And then however much that group decide what the production level is for the entire group will influence what the market price is for oil. 
and that's a cartel, right? Because that's when you have multiple companies or multiple countries joined together to behave as one. That's a cartel. Okay, so um, now unique to cartel, there's something called a game theory. Now, if you guys, anybody who want to major in economics or want to study uh, upper level econ classes, there's actually classes on game theory. So game theory is whenever you have, um, you know, imagine you set up a game um, and with payoff involved to see how players, you know, behave under defense scenario. That's called game theory. The most very well known game theory is called a prisoner dilemma. Uh, now this was made um, famous by a, um, a, a mathematician who already passed away. His name was John Nash. Uh, there was a movie made about him. So if you guys watch a movie called uh, A Beautiful Mind by Russell Crowe, uh, that's about John Nash, right? So um, so let me show you how this actually works. So imagine we have two prisoners here um, and then they are arrested. Um, but before they went to trial, uh, they were both offered a deal. Uh, they can either uh, confess uh, to the crime they made as a, as a, as a partners or as a group, <coughs> or they can choose not to confess. Now, if both prisoners choose to confess, so imagine person A choose to confess, um, person B choose to confess, then both people here will end up with five years each. Now, if nobody confess, so everybody remains silent, then the, let's say the, the district attorney only has limited evidence, then each person get only two years in jail. Now, if person B choose to uh, confess and person A choose to remain silent, um, person B will get off easy. So person B get one year in jail and then person A will be punished, get eight years in jail. And then vice versa, if person A confess and person B doesn't, person A will be uh, getting one year in jail and person B will be, will be punished by getting eight years in jail. Now, if you just look at these numbers here, looks like the best outcome between the groups. So what's the, what should the group do as a group? Uh, they should behave over here. So everybody getting two years each. So let's see how this prisoner dilemma actually works out, right? So uh, one of the biggest assumptions we have to make is that each person here is going after their own self-interest. So what's best for themselves, not what's best for the group. Now what's best for the group is nobody confess, everybody remain silent. But let's suppose person B knows person A very well. So person B knows for sure that person A would choose to remain silent. Then what should person B do? Well, if person B remains silent, he'll get two years, but if he confess, he'll get one year and one year is better, right? So if person A remains silent, then person B would choose to confess. But what if person B expect that person A always choose to confess? What should person B do? Now, if person B remains silent while person A confess, he'll get eight years. But if person B also confess, he'll get five years. So five years better than eight years. So person B will choose to confess whenever person A choose to confess or person A remains silent. So for person B here, it doesn't matter what person A does. The confession is the best outcome. Right, because it doesn't matter what person A does, either remain silent or choose to confess, it's always better for person B to confess. Same deal with person A, the confession is also person A's dominant strategy. So both party choose person, uh, the both party will choose to confess and we're gonna end up uh, right here, five years each, which seems like the worst outcome possible, right? So. Uh, this is why each person is only behaving in their own self-interest and then cheat under the original agreement. Now, this is the present dilemma. You can also apply this in the real world environment. So imagine we have two companies here. Um, both companies have a choice either to hold down output, so produce less or produce more. Now, if everybody produce less, then they can charge a higher prices. So both companies get $1,000 each profit. Uh, but if everybody produces more, then the overall supply increases, then price goes down, then both companies only get $400. All right, so again, as a group, as a group, then the company should produce over here, right? So as a group, we, have, we should have agreement that everybody should produce less. But let's look at, again, company B here. If company A choose to have a lower production, what should company B do? Now for company B, if they choose lower production, uh, they will get 
1,000, which is not bad. But if they choose a higher production, uh, they actually get 1,500, and that's better. Um, so if company A choose lower production, then company B would choose increased production. Now, what if company A choose increased production? What should company B do? Now, if company B also choose uh, increased production, that's a 400. But if they choose lower production, they will only get 200. So 400 is better. So for company B here, increased production is the dominant strategy. That means it doesn't matter what company A does, it's always better for company B to increase production. And that's called a dominant strategy. And because both parties here have a dominant strategy, then they both choose to increase production and they're gonna end up at 400 and 400. So this is called Nash equilibrium. Okay, so where each company is only going after what's best for themselves and therefore everybody is worse off. So one way to get around this um, cheating scenario in a prison dilemma is we can use something called a kink demand curve that where companies can punish others when they're cheating in this prisoner dilemma. Um, so imagine company says, um, if you go lower prices or if you uh, cheat in the system, I would cheat as well. Um, but if you stick to our original agreement, then we can stick to our original agreement. So it's really, um, it's the threat or practice to match the behavior of the other company that will produce what is called a kinked demand curve. So let me show you what that looks like, right? So, um, so your regular demand curve is a straight line downward sloping, but for kink demand curve, we have this little, um, this little kink here at the, at the end, right? So that's a, that's a kink demand curve. Um, so this is how it works. So the agreement between two companies is that we should both produce at a thousand, a 10,000 unit, and each company will get a price of 500. Now, however, if this one company decide to cheat, the other company will match the cheating behavior. So if the one company decides to cheat, so produce 11,000, the other company also produce 11,000 at the same time, and that will force the price to go down, right? So, uh, so if you, if you cheat, then you're both going to end up over here, which is bad, right? So you want to stick to our original agreement, but, um, we don't match your behavior if you choose to have a worse outcome. So if this one company, again, remember the agreement is 10,000 unit, $500 prices. But if, what if this one company decides to charge 550? Well, that's fine. You charge a higher prices. The other company who still charge at 500, this can still sell more unit. But for this company who does, you know, who choose the worst outcome, they're going to sell less unit and they're going to be worse off. So with a kink demand curve, the best position is this point right here that everybody stick to agreement and we all produce 10,000 charge 500. Okay. All right, guys. So that's it for this chapter. Any question, let me know. And I will see you for next chapter. All right. Bye-bye.